begin with an interview from 1958, when Davis was in the UK filming The Scapegoat with Alec Guinness. The actor Derek Bond joined her at Edgewebury Country Club, where, ignoring the threat of an impending storm, Davis discussed the beginnings of her film career, the qualities she looked for in a leading man, and introduced the audience to her daughter, Barbara. Apologise for our climate. Oh, please don't. It's quite like our own. It is, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mr. Davis, you began your career in the theatre. Did you intend to stay in the theatre, or did you just look at it as training for the films? No, I actually started in the theatre to be in the theatre. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, when I started in the theatre, we had silent pictures. I don't think any theatre people had any idea what would happen when sound came in, as we say. Yeah. It was a complete revolution, actually because then they did need um, actors trained for the theatre yes. uh, because of the sound. So then there was an enormous trek to mm -hmm. Hollywood by practically, they signed practically all of us as tests, you know, to see if, if we would work there or not. Now, did you find that, did you go to films because you felt that there was more scope for an actress in films than in the theatre? <sighs> well, I look back on it, I don't know. I, I guess I felt that if it was an opportunity that I, as a a very young person couldn't afford to miss, probably. I didn't go with, with great anticipation. You didn't? No, not at all. But I, I felt I was probably very fortunate, and, and I should give it a try. Did you enjoy the change at the beginning? No, well, I had a very difficult time in the beginning. Yeah. I was not welcomed with open arms. As a matter of fact, I, I um, arrived in the Los Angeles station and had been told I would be met by um, the Universal officials, which was my studio. And uh, no one was there to meet me at all. So we kind of staggered to the hotel, finding our way around, my mother and I. And uh, I called the studio and I said, why wasn't anyone there to meet me? Mm. And they said, well, we didn't see anyone get off the train who looked like an actress. <laughs> so I said, well, I had a dog with me. They should have known. <laughs> but it was incredible. It was a whole, just a whole new era. And we all felt we should try it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Now, people who have seen you working on the set have written that uh, you are a very technical actress, always conscious of the camera and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you give a sustained emotional performance. How do these two, two go together? Well, I've never actually ever been very bright about uh, uh, the camera and the technical part. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one thing I've not coped with. I've had quite hard enough time to <laughs> to <laughs> do my part of it. The only time I ever sort of um, have, a, have a problem with the camera is if, if, if I notice it. Yeah. You see, this, this, this is awkward. As far as the emotional uh, continuity is concerned, this is really training. This yeah. is the hardest thing, of course, for the theater actress to do yes. when she starts in films. We talked about that a little earlier. Uh, to, to leave off for half an hour and come back and hit the same pitch. And I would feel um, sort of much more pleased with myself mm. if I could do it, if so many others couldn't also. <laughs> it's just, it's actually, a it's really a, a training that one must work on very hard. Yes. And actually, George Arliss, who was my great mentor uh, at the time when Hollywood was about kafuft for me, uh, gave me a very good hint once. He said, never make a scene in front of a camera that you don't remember what went before and what went after. Yeah. Then it will usually tie in. Yeah. In other words, just don't sort of go in without reviewing in your mind exactly how it was. Yeah. But the technical thing of getting your marks at the same time sustaining emotion... Do that, you is, that is practice. You are honestly... I don't, know how, I don't really know how we do it. Yeah. Because you must do it without ever looking. You, you, it's, it, it's, it becomes an instinct, I, I feel, finally. Yeah. Not at first. This is extremely hard tying at first, yeah. you know. You feel like a puppet sort of that can't yeah. move. Now let's, let's talk for a moment about the character you played. I read on a poster once that nobody's as good as Betty Davis when she's bad. <laughs> <laughs> you have played quite a number of bad women. Is it because you think playing nice women is dull? Well, of course, I sort of never call them bad women. I have a theory that no one person is all bad and no one person is all good. The only requirement I have is character, at least, is definite, whether good or bad. Um, and um, I think the more definite people uh, tend to have more sort of evil traits, the more interesting people. Yeah. And um, that is probably why. Now, in these very different characters that you play, how do you get into the character? How do you set about it? Oh, I just think you pray half <laughs> the time. You know, I, I, I don't think there's much planning 
that you can do. If you do a, a, a Somerset Maugham story, like of human bondage, you practically have a textbook. This is different. I mean, you read this book and you, you know this character from what he said inside and out, which makes it easier. With an original character, it's sort of your own ideas of her and uh, just thinking, trying to think the way she did. I don't know. There's a school of thought that thinks that actors should completely identify with themselves with the character. I think it's called the method. Do you approve of this? Ah, uh, well, no, I don't. Because it probably dates me that I've, um, I, I just, uh, uh, it's just not for me. I must be fair and say, maybe it is for some people. But I think it's um, a very untheatrical kind of acting. Yeah. You know, not that I don't think films, um, prime requisite is a certain reality, but there is a certain way of, of giving a performance to your audience. And I think this is a little bit like peeking through keyholes at real life. I, I, just, I just don't really understand it at all. Don't like it, I yeah. must say. I don't. Oh, Beady, Beady, come here. I want you to meet Mr. Derek Bond, my daughter Barbara. Hello, Hello Barbara. Not a very satisfactory day for riding. No. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been? Have you been over here before to this country? No, I, I've been here once before when I was only four years old, but that's pretty hard to remember. Mm. How many foreign countries have you been to outside America? Uh, this trip is the only time I've been over, even to Spain, Italy, and France, and this country. Do you enjoy traveling? Do you like it? Oh, yes, I like it very much, but it is work. You get homesick? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's work, is it? <laughs> I don't get homesick. Mm -hmm. You don't? Yeah. When you grow up, do you, would you like to be an actress like your mother? Not, that's not one of my first choices. Mm -hmm. What would you want to do? I'd like to be a secretary. Hmm? Secretary? Well, yes. <laughs> Darling, why don't you run along? See you Bye. later. Goodbye. Nice to meet you. And you. Miss Davis, how did you feel if she had said she wanted to be an actress? Oh, well, uh, wanting to be an actress is just, um, if you want to, you must. Mm -hmm. Kind of a, I guess it's a kind of a drive, and it's a thing that you absolutely have to do. And if this were it, then, then she must. I could hope for her that um, her life would run along a little more normal channels, and that she wouldn't have this great need for expressing herself mm -hmm. in, 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 this, in this way. But if so... Do you think people can be happier doing something else? I mean, do you, have you... No, no, I think one is happiest doing what one must do. Yeah. You know, I really think I've been an incredibly fortunate person and had a most wonderfully happy life as regards the accomplishment of my life. Uh, I don't think it's an easy life, mm -hmm. you know, I must say. Yeah. Why don't we go in and yes. have some tea? Good idea, thank you. Now, your success has given you the authority to choose your director and your story. What do you look for first when you're considering a new film? Well, I try to be very honest and worry most about the story. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly in our business, since the years I started, uh, the story has become the more important thing. Yeah. And um, I think for the most part, I, I have been able to. One also has to say one considers the part mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. But I think of the two today, I would prefer the story that I think the audience would like. Yeah. I think that's the picture that's selling today more than just a, a story that features a sensational performance, which once, we must say, I must say, we could get away with. Yeah. But I don't feel any longer. You've starred with some very distinguished leading men. What are the qualities that you would consider the most important in a leading man? Oh. Well, I think that, he, that he's a good actor. Mm -hmm. You know, that I think that he, he's a good actor. And I must say it's an enormous help to me if he enjoys acting. Mm -hmm because uh, this makes the film a much happier thing to make. Yeah. It's basically. Would you say it was important to like somebody you were playing with off screen, or do you just consider no, them as a No, I, I think, uh, I think uh, that is, uh, I think one would be very limited to think that way. I think there's nothing to do with whatsoever. Yeah. I think um, the talent is, is the whole thing. There's many sort of um, unpleasant people mm -hmm. are very talented. You know, one would limit oneself very much, I think, if one cared how much one liked somebody personally. The bond between mother and daughter did not remain as warm as it was captured in this interview. As an adult, Barbara claimed her mother had been emotionally abusive. 
she accused Davis's fourth husband, Gary Merrill, whom Davis met on the set of All About Eve, of being a violent alcoholic. These claims were all strongly denied. In 1972, Davis was back in the UK and back being interviewed, this time by Joan Bakewell, in front of an audience at the National Film Theatre. In your autobiography, you confess that it was when you saw The Wild Duck in the New York Theatre. Mm. It was at that evening, that very moment, you decided to become an actress. I sort of always knew I'd do something, but I'd never saw it. I was 16 then, I believe. But the girl who played Hedvig was at the Jewett Playhouse in Boston. Uh, we were just twins, and I somehow identified with her. Plus, it was the kind of a part I would love, and I finally played it. From that moment on, though, once you had said you wished to be an actress... Well, I continued with school. You know, I graduated from, from prep school. And then I was very fortunate in a mother who, who allowed me to spread my wings. And, and she saw it, too, that I went to New York to a dramatic school, which is the proper training, really, which you do much more in England than they do in America. And uh, it just sort of went on from there. Well, I was going to remark on the fact that your mother's back backing of your ambition and her total dedication to was your incredible. career was... And without being a stage mother, she was never around where I worked at all. It's just her belief was extraordinary. I don't quite know why she had it. I certainly didn't in the beginning. How dare those Hollywood moguls at the time when you first went from New York to Hollywood suggest that you couldn't be as sexy and glamorous as any other star? <laughs> Well, according to their standards, you see, I wasn't. Now, this was really in the very beginning of talking pictures, and all of us, uh, us who came out from the theater were, were not actressy kind of people. You know, we sort of had our own color hair and maybe a couple of teeth crooked. We looked, you know, totally different, and they were very, very puzzled. You know, and, and off screen, we didn't go around all dressed up, say like a hollow or somebody would, you know? So they just did not understand us at all. So we just were, you know, they called me the little brown wren. But then, finally, you see, nobody helps you when you go about makeup or about the camera. It's a wholly new profession, really. And finally, they find out, you know, the best way to wear your hair, that they put a makeup on you that does the best for you. It's just a slow process of getting to look on the screen what you really thought you looked like in life. You know? <laughs> Because I, I, I thought I was fairly attractive till I got to Hollywood, but I didn't for very long. <laughs> no. But you did have to fight off all their attempts to glamorize you in their terms. Oh, didn't yes, you? yes. Hepburn, Margaret Sullivan, and I were the three who really fought it. You know, fought the. Although when I went to Warner's, they made me, you know, really bleach my hair. And I knew it was going to limit me the part, so I snuck down one day and had it, you know, put back the ash blonde hair I'd always had. And one year later, Mr. Wallace sent for me and said, you've had your hair re-dyed. <laughs> one year later, he'd never seen it. But if I had gone for permission, he wouldn't have allowed it, you see. And I, I didn't want to go through life with a very bleached head of hair. But it was the factory getting to work because they even suggested changing your name, didn't they? Oh, yes. They wanted to call me Bettina Dawes. <laughs> To be a little vulgar in this illustrious group, I said, I refuse to be called between the drawers all my life. <laughs> Which I would have. No question. It's very well you uh, joking about it now, but of course, at the time, for a young girl... Heartbreak. It must have been... Awful. It was absolutely heartbreak. Yes, I remember sitting in the outer office and Mr. Lemley was talking to somebody, and he was talking about me, not knowing I was there, and he said, Yes, she's got as much sex appeal as Slim Somerville. <laughs> and you see, you're, you're so right to... Oh, I, I was defeated. And, and for instance, they would say, who wants to get her at the end of the picture? <laughs> and, and, and this does... <laughs> True. And, and this really does catastrophic things to your ego. And I didn't have a lot of ego and, and never have had lots anyway, which is... Big misnomer about actors. We had very little ego, basically, you know. So how did you salvage what little well, was just left all, of your confidence? Well, it, oh, let's sort of changed mm -hmm. the whole... At least I had, could hold my head high in a film of his, which was an important film. Then I had five or six more years, you know, when I came to England and fought the whole thing. 
but you just had to hang on. And Ruthie, my mother, was, you know, so cute when, when all the years went by and these awful things were said about you. She'd always say, it's the best fruit the birds pick at. And I thought it was so sweet. You know, she said, just remember. Because it was heartbreaking. Of course it was. For that period of time, Warner Brothers must have thought you were, although when their top star, a very difficult property indeed. No, I don't think so. I was, um, we weren't a lot. Warner's was a marvelous workman-like studio as opposed to Metro. Metro was really a beautiful, glamour place. There was no red carpet for any actor at Warner's. Absolutely not. We were not allowed this. And we just all worked very, very hard. And uh, I wouldn't, you know, those 18 years w were, were my life. And they were very, very good to me. And I regret today that the young people don't have contracts to work under. Because the contract gives you a, a continuity. See, you, that's what I mean by longevity. Nobody could escape me. You know, you made eight and 10 <laughs> pictures a year, you know. <laughs> You know, you really did. And then also, the Warner product was the first product sold for television. And this is many, many years ago now, 65 films of which were mine. So I just sort of kept on going, you know, again, longevity. But I was fortunate there too. Is it true that you were called the fourth Warner brother? By Bob Hope, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely adorable. We had this marvelous Warner employees party every year. And he emceed it this particular year, and he got up and introduced Miss Betty Davis, the fourth Warner brother. Talk about Miss Butler. That was the film where you first worked with Olivia de Havilland, wasn't it? Well, I, I, she and I were there together yes. many, many years. She's my great, great she's friend. She's become a great friend of yours yeah, now. She, she's always been a great friend of mine. Is yes. it difficult for stars to be close friends? Well, actors as a group are not my passion. <laughs> what Social about one by one? Socially. No, uh, I always uh, socially love writers and directors, m m much more interested. A group of actors uh, together can be rather tiresome, and whose rushes were what, and all this, you know? You said the most remarkable thing in your book, which rather bewildered me, but it sounds very splendid. An actor is always less than a man. Oh, this is a French, a very old French An saying. An actress more than a woman. That's right. It's a very old French saying. Do yeah. you agree with that? And <laughs> yes, I have to be very honest. I think, uh, I don't think you can make generalities, and I think there are very, very many exceptions. Certainly, a beautiful man, Claude Rains, and our beautiful man, uh, Mr. Tracy, and, and Mr. Cooper and Mr. Gable certainly were not less than men. But it's a strange profession for a man, truthfully. Steve McQueen, for instance, does all this motorcycling, you know, to keep him sure he's a man. <laughs> he told me that. He's, he's the most marvelous guy, Steve McQueen. I just, it's just great. And he told me one night, he said, you know, I said, why do you take a chance? You're one of the few smashing uh, young men that have come along and we need you desperately. He said, because it's a strange profession for a man. And I just want to stay in something else to, to keep being a man. Interesting. Miss Davis, something I've wanted to ask you for 30 years. <laughs> To marry you? <laughs> Three others got in the way. <laughs> How did you get started on the stairs? All your marvelous entrances were downstairs. You just made a wonderful one now. I have lived on stairs, haven't I? <laughs> I don't know. It just always happened. And also, stairs are very, very dramatic. You know, they are truthfully dramatic. I I've killed men on stairs, <laughs> falling down on stairs. I don't know. It it's, a, it it's a strange thing, because I say that about myself in, in all the parts, you know? In Madame Sin we're making now, there's a gorgeous staircase, and I said to the director, you of course are going to have me come down those stairs. <laughs> he said, I never thought of it. <laughs> The success of the interviews like this led to Davis touring the world with her show, Bette Davis in person and on film. In 1975, a book and that tour brought her to the UK once more and to an appearance on The Parkinson Show. Thank you. Thank you.
Very. I was at a press conference the other day, which had 150 journalists at it, which was for you. And I doubt if Henry Kissinger would have got, or any head of state would have got more journalists there. Um, but somebody asked a question of you there about what it was like to be a Hollywood legend. Mm -hmm. And you denied that you were. Well, you see, unless I am performing, I don't really think of myself very often in the professional, um, professional part of my life. I, I, I really don't. And uh, so therefore, I don't, there's no way you could think of yourself as a legend. And uh, I can't help but be complimented. Mm. You, 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 you must not ignore this and say, well, it's just nothing. But I don't think of it. I don't think of myself that way. You don't? At all, no. But I mean, I mean you accept, if you look back on the history of Hollywood, there have been what? I suppose three great women stars. There's Garbo, Hepburn, yourself. Would you, would you agree with that running order? Well, I, I will accept the running order, yes. <laughs> of course, I'd be happier if I got first billing, but I'll tell you. I was putting them in, his, in historical no, perspective. No, well, if I am included with those two fabulous women, I am delighted. What, in fact, you're, you're over here now, apart from the, the, the book, you're touring, aren't you, and you're, uh, you're doing a show. Yes, it is, it is an evening with me on film and on stage. Mm -hmm. And audience participation, which is what Oh, Ron my Moody part of it, yes, is absolutely with the audience. Was talking about. What kind of, what's the most, uh, what's the question you get asked most of all by these people? Because you've done this all over America, haven't you, and all over the Oh, I was in Australia and New Zealand all the first part of this year, which was a fabulous, a fabulous trip, and, and I found a fabulous country, mm. you know. Well, they're very, very varied. There is one question I am always asked. Did I name the Oscar? And fascinatingly enough, the only night I was not asked this question was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the night of the Oscar show, which I thought was very, very strange. Yes, I'm always asked that. I was asked that uh, everywhere in Australia and New Zealand. What's the answer? Uh, well, I feel I did. How? The, well, uh, my first husband's middle initial was O, and he never would tell me what it was, because he detested the name so. And finally, I found out that the, uh, his middle name was Oscar. And uh, the rear end of the Oscar looked like him. Rear <laughs> end? <laughs> and I always called it Oscar. Now, I, the Academy uh, refuses to accept this, and I sort of willingly say the Academy. I see. But that's my memory of it. Of course, it was a long time ago. When you, were, when you first went there, you said you were a puzzlement to all these people, and indeed you must have been. Did they um, ever try to tart you up, glamorize you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, in a film called Fashions of 1934. Yes, they made me up as nearly as possible to look like Miss Garbo, which, of course, is utterly impossible. They gave me the lovely long bob, and the nice, beautiful, wide mouth, and the long, long lashes. Uh, it, it, was, it was really sickening, because it wasn't my type. And thank God I had brains enough to know that, you know, and I never let them do that again. Yes. How do you mean you never let them do that again? Because you, 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 you I just didn't. I just said you cannot either fire me or let me be what I personally am. You yeah. cannot. You cannot be somebody else, but or a, a copy, or anything else. But as a contract artist, of course, I would imagine that, that took a certain amount of guts, didn't it? Well, yes. Yes, I was a meddler for my own good, but it becomes, it becomes self-preservation, really, if it, if it had continued that way. And they did that with so very many theatre people they brought out. You know, changed all their teeth, changed their noses, changed everything. And, and those who had any individuality uh, just never made it because they just looked phony. Of course, I suppose of human bondage was in fact the film that was one of the big. That was the first step on the ladder, That's right. and that was a loan out to RKO. Yes, that was the first rung. Yes, that's right. You played a Cockney, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. Can yes, you still I do did. the accent? Well, I'm not going to sit here and do it. <laughs> just wondered if you could, that's all. Oh, yes, I, I received many compliments. Of course, when I started the film with all the all-English cast, particularly Mr. Leslie Howard, they were very, very distraught. Really? They're all oh, very upset that American girls playing it. Yes. Really? 
Very. But you gradually won them I over. don't mind. That's what Mildred said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. And the thing... <laughs> but the thing about it was, Mildred was a lady like Cockney. You know, it's much easier to do the very broad Cockney. Yeah. But she always tried to be a lady, you see. So it had to be a... It had to be a very legitimate speech. I worked very hard on it for many months before I did it. Yes. Did you ever feel, because you, you cornered a market in Hollywood, didn't you, at one point in your career, of playing a, of playing a, not evil women, but uh, rather... No, some... they were very, very... I played just as many others. You did? Evil is remembered more. Yes, I suppose. Evil is the... For instance, newspaper people know this. You know, they don't print many good things about people. Mm. There is a, a mad interest in evil in all human beings, I really think. Yes. And a remembrance of it. Well let, Definitely. Me, well, let me put it another way, then. In some of those movies, certainly, you played a rather intimidating woman. Oh, I had some marvelous parts, like Little Foxes. Mm. You know, marvelous women to play that were very difficult. Mm. I wondered if, in fact, the, the kind of... The, that sort of image that, the, that grew up around that time, if it had ever affected your relationships with men off-screen or with your fellow actors, whether they arrived no, no, with a preconceived no. notion of what oh, you Oh, I think, I think many... Because I've played many women of that kind, that... There is a, a preconceived notion of me. How true would it be? But I never behaved that way. <laughs> I, wonder I mean, imagine <laughs> going home and, and, and being Mildred in bondage all evening at dinner, you know. Of course, a lot of actors would say, in fact, that you must live the part, that you must carry well, it through. Well, uh, everybody to his own. I'm not going to criticize an actor who has to do that. Maybe that's the way that actor has... has Paul Muni did this, always. What, took the part oh, home? Oh, Bella Muni, his wife, said she had lived with more men than any woman <laughs> in the world. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question, actually, which is a quote from a book, not that book, but your first, your autobiography, which was written in 1963, in which you said, all my marriages were a farce. In The Lonely Life? That's right, The Lonely Life. I said they were a farce. Mm. Well, that was a strange thing for me to say. <laughs> Now, there must have been something before that quote and after it. Well, it was in the last chapter, as I remember it, where you were summing up your life and you were talking about the difficulties of being the career woman, the star, yes. and at the same time maintaining a, a, a the married status. Yes, well, it is difficult, no question. So that's what I must have meant, that they seemed like farces because they did not turn out to be neither successful or real marriages. Would you, um, how would you feel about working in today's more permissive cinema, where, I mean, in your days, I mean, there was... Well, I wish we had had some, some of the permissive. I wish we could have had half um, what, what is today. We could have been more honest in all the love stories. Mm. And I wish today they did it half as much. Uh, as regards the nudity, of course, we were never faced with this. Uh, that I would never ever have done. You wouldn't. No, and there are many young actresses today suffering from the fact that they will not do it either. No. And they're losing very good parts for this yes. reason. And what does the future hold then? Are you going around touring with this, uh, with this uh, oh, show? Oh, I do, I do this. This year I'm the second time. I shall probably do this show once a year. I hope next year to go to South America. Yeah. And um, I don't work uh, terribly much anymore. Uh, I have just finished a film, so this has been a very big year, much more working year than usual. Yes. That's what keeps you slim, is it? Keeping on the move and keeping busy? Well, I've always kept on the move, yes. Yeah. Yes. And if we could just sort of sum up in, in uh, I don't know, do you have, when you read that book back and you, you look at your career, is there one sort of philosophy that you had through life which is, sums up the book and sums up you? Well, I think I stated in my comment at the end of this, and it took me a long time to decide what to say. The one thing I think that really stands by a human being is their work, in the long run, over all the years. One may have great disappointments in all sorts of areas, and even in your work, but if you still have a work you love, that is, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Mm. Uh, Davis, thank you. Um, I'd just say that if I got one ambition left, it would be to play Paul Henry part in now. Well, Voyager. why don't you try it before we go? Well, shall I do it? I just, Come I on. really want to do this. I wonder if the bank could give me a. Harry, can you play that lovely theme? Yes, let's play the theme. That's now right. you can take I... the two cigarettes. <laughs> da 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 dee da da. 
I'll go meet him. Buddy. My dear, it was perfect. <laughs> Twelve years later, it was another book promotion that returned Davis to the BBC. This time on the Wogan show. Now, age 79, a series of strokes had left her looking very frail. But the personality, forceful but fun, was as evident as ever. Can I just establish, before we start, how we call you? Because there is a, it's a sort of argument. Is it, is it Bet or Betty? It is supposed to be Bet. It is taken from the French Balzac's Cousine Bet. The original pronunciation Bet. Yeah. And it took me 15 years to educate everybody to say Betty. And I found out that they were all right. But, of course, Betty, I prefer. You prefer Betty? I prefer, yes. I so I, all... I accept either now, it's just as long as they call the name, that's all I yeah. care. Because <laughs> a, a lot of people here call you Betty, and I think in America it's Betty, isn't it? Mostly Betty. In well, no. Really? Sometimes it's Beat. Beat? Yes. Beat I don't like that very much. <laughs> oh, no. oh, Beat Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like visiting here? Or you like visiting England? Oh, England is really my second home. I was born and brought up in New England. Yeah. And, uh, we're all the same kind of people, after all. We all came from here. Yeah. Well, oh, I, yes, I, I, this is really a second home to me, England. Yeah, because somebody said, oh, well, you oh, misquoted you, perhaps, as saying you didn't like being here or something, didn't they? Oh, yes, that I detested coming here. Yeah. Well, yes, well, I think those that? things we just forget. Yeah. Pretend they weren't said, because it's absolutely absurd. I adore coming to England. I've been here, I've made about eight films here, and I look forward to coming here for my book. Yeah. Yes. Which you've just done, of course, your book. Yes. Yeah. Now, you've, you've also made eight films here. You've made a, a hundred. We were talking them up. You've made about a hundred films. The last Nearly, one was your hundredth film, I think. Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah. What? Having been famous, successful, two Oscars, ten nominations altogether, th there would be a tendency to rest on your laurels, wouldn't there? Why do you keep going? Oh, because I love, love, love making films. Yes, always will. Or the, or the roar of the crowd. And there's never really resting on your laurels. You must get better. Get the next thing better than the last one. Yeah. And that's an incentive. Do you remember the, the beginning? Oh, very clearly, yes. Do you My find... memory's very good, even at this wild age. I remember everything. Well, we won't, we won't be indelicate and ask you how old you are. Oh, my dear, everybody knows how old I am. I am 79. I have never lied about my age in my life. Right. <laughs> uh, I have to say, that announcement, you applaud. Applaud with great pleasure. I don't applaud that. <laughs> <laughs> Distinguished now, can you look back over the hundred films and say, that was the favorite person I worked with? Who you mean it? director or, or, or actor? For actor for a start. Well, I think my favorite person to work with was Claude Rains, yeah. who I consider one of our greatest actors. I really do. Who was your unfavorite? <laughs> well, Edward G. Robinson was kind of a pig about his photographs. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, I had to kiss him in a scene as a very young girl. And I didn't care about that very much. No, no. He was, he, he was the kind that would go to the editor and say, now, you know that long scene speech that Betty has. I have a lot of thoughts to get over, so you can keep cutting back to me. Yes. He, he was quite a pig. 
Well, I'd, you, you had a reputation of being a pretty tough woman yourself. You, you wouldn't have tolerated that, surely. You would have said well, to the director, keep the that, camera on I, me, wouldn't you? I'd have left that up to the director. Really? Of course the director plans all that. We don't plan it. But you never made suggestions like, say, Edward G. would say. You never suggest anything oh, to a director? Oh, heavens, no. No, no. No, no. Was there any, any actor, and you, and you worked with so many, but was there any actor that you wanted to work with but never did? Oh, of course. I never worked with Clark Gable. I never worked with Gary Cooper. Actually, I never worked with any of the so-called terrific true. male stars of the day. See, we worked with people in our own studios. Was there any part that you desperately wanted? Yes, for many, many years I wanted to play Mary Lincoln and start her out sort of, you know, early before the White House and go on. But it never worked out. Yes, I would very much wanted to do that. Piece you of have work. to ask me about my book. <laughs> You see, I, I know you're enormously popular in England, and I'm thrilled to be on your show. <laughs> I came on this show to sell a book. I am in England to sell a book. Oh, I don't know. We're glad yes. to see whether you come well, to sell good. a book or not. Yes, I'm a saleswoman. Yes, they... they well, I, I think that's Sedgwick probably... Sedgwick and Company have bought my book, <laughs> and I must say I'm very proud of it. A lot of the information that... Obviously, I'm talking to you about now comes oh, yes. from the book because it's, In a, this, yes. it's a biography and it's all about no, no. your films. No, no, this is not a biography. Isn't it? No, 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 no. Not all about my films are never mentioned. Okay. No, this and that is exactly what it says. This and that. Odds and ends and odds and ends. Now, in England, they have added the word, two words, a memoir. Well, they are, of course, many, many memories, but it's really not necessary that, but it's not autobiographical at all, no. But it's about you. It's just about things I think. Things and people that have you've happened met. to me. People you've met. And people I have met, yeah. yes? Yes. And we worked very hard on it, and we're very thrilled. It was on the New York Times <laughs> bestseller list for four months, which is terrific. Yeah. So we can sit here and say it's successful at home. We hope it will be successful here. <laughs> and you're very... I appreciate very much you gave me this opportunity to talk about my book. <laughs> I had and still have a reputation for being a formidable, a formidable lady both to work with and indeed you, you had a a one-woman strike against the studios, didn't you? Against Warner Brothers. Yes, because I wanted good directors and good scripts. When, and I signed for a film here in England. And Mr. Warner took me to court. And I lost here. But in the long run, what do they say? I lost the... You lost the battle, but battle won the war. Battle, but I won the war, yes. By the, by the seriousness of my getting good films. Hmm. which I was not getting, and I knew I would never go anywhere if I didn't have help with good scripts. What gave you that drive? Was it, was it your mother, who I know was an enormous inspiration to your great help? No, I was complaining constantly about my bosses, the men who paid me, and I got sick of complaining, and I said, you must, you must do something about it or just don't talk about it which is true. So that's what I did about it, hoping it would work out. Yeah, and you won the war. And he had an option on Gone with the Wind, and the last visit with him in the office, he said, oh, I, I said I was going on suspension. I was not going to work for a while. He said, I have optioned the most wonderful book for you. The title is Gone with the Wind. And I looked at him and I said, I'll bet it's a pip. <laughs> and off I went. And when I came back, <laughs> back from England, it was a pip. It was a pip. It was a pip. Yeah, but you can't win them all, for goodness sake. No, what, no. what about a film of your life? Oh, I hope never done while I'm here. Who would you like to play the part? 
Well, we'd have to do some searching. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I am very against these life stories on film with people alive. I mean, for instance, I don't know who would play Ruthie, my mother. No, I, I, it would kill me. It would really kill me to have, I don't want it done. And my life really and truly has basically been work. And you, there's not a lot else in my life but that. And I think it would be extremely dull. I really do. Well, you had three husbands. I knew you were going to say that. I almost said it for you. <laughs> Well, that wasn't... It wasn't an uneventful life. No, well... Uh, Sorry, it isn't an uneventful life. <laughs> no, so you find three men that are my three husbands, and they're nothing like the husbands were. No, but I knew you'd say that, of course. <laughs> well, I just hope it's never done while I'm around. Well, I hope you'll continue to delight us with your performances. Well, I do thank you for this, really and truly. It was a great pleasure. Plus, nice to meet you. I believe in former years we couldn't make time to be on your show. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yes, I remember now. So it's good to have you. And you're incredibly attractive. Thank you. <laughs> Two years after this appearance, Davis died of breast cancer. Her passing away made front page news across the world and ended another chapter from the golden age of Hollywood. <laughs>